the digital station for comedy, drama, and entertainment. BBC Radio 4 Extra. Well now, if you caught this weekend's edition of Archive on 4 over on Radio 4, you'll have heard Roy Hudd examining Charles Chilton's forgotten 1961 radio masterpiece, which inspired the musical Oh, What a Lovely War. The Long, Long Trail tells the story of the First World War through the musical songs of Edwardian Britain, sung by the soldiers in the trenches. But as Chilton himself pointed out, these were not so much the popular jolly marching songs we're familiar with, like It's a Long Way to Tipperary, but rather the songs which reflected the soldiers' inner feelings, his hopes, desires, his attitude to authority and the enemy, and the hellish conditions he had to endure. The inspiration for the original broadcast came when Chilton went searching for his father's grave in northern France during a family holiday in the 1950s. Instead, he discovered his father's name inscribed on a wall amongst some 35,000 names of soldiers, all missing, presumed dead. He'd never met his father, who died in 1918 at just 19 years old, and the programme became part of a personal quest to learn more about the father he never knew. Well, in 1962, Chilton and director Joan Littlewood joined forces to adapt the programme into the landmark stage musical Oh, What a Lovely War. But then the original programme disappeared and was never broadcast again. Until now. Shortly before he died last January, Charles Chilton gave a copy to the British Library. So now, on 4 Extra, as part of our tribute to Charles Chilton one year on from his death, here is that original 1961 broadcast featuring, as one of the narrators, the actor and future MP Andrew Folds, known to millions as Captain Jet Morgan, in Chilton's Journey into Space. <laughs> We present The Long, Long Train, soldier songs of the First World War, mainly from the Western Front. There's a long, long night of waiting Until my dreams are come true Till the day when I'll be going Down that long, long train with you Great Britain entered the First World War on August the 4th, 1914. She went to the aid of Belgium, which had been invaded by Germany. In London, the war fever spread with remarkable swiftness. Whitehall and Parliament Square were thronged with vast crowds of excited and boisterous people. They marched through the streets singing, Rule Britannia, three cheers for the red, white and blue, and the Marseillaise. On August the 6th, the first recruiting posters appeared. The moustached face of Lord Kitchener, Secretary of State for War, gazed sternly down from the sides of buses and the fronts of hoardings and announced, Your king and country need you. The stage, in the shapely form of Miss Phyllis Dare, the musical comedy artist, helped in the recruiting campaign by presenting the country with its first recruiting song. With what you play in cricket and every kind of game, at football, golf and polo, you men have made your name. But now your country calls you to play your part in war. And no matter what befalls you, we shall love you all the more. So come and join the forces as your fathers did before. Oh, we don't want to lose you, cause we think you ought to go. The German plan was for her armies to advance into Belgium through the narrow passage that lies between the Ardennes and the Dutch border. But Belgium presented such stiff resistance at Liège that the German plan was put ten days behind schedule. The brave little country seemed to justify the great optimism about the outcome of a war that was felt by most people in Britain. Gallant little Belgium. She had put the kibosh on the Kaiser's caper and no mistake. 
To some, the war seemed to be over almost before it had begun. A silly German sausage dreamt Napoleon he'd be. Then went and broke his promise, it was made in Germany. He shook hands with Britannia and eternal peace he swore. But naughty boy, he talked of peace while he prepared for war. He stirred up little Serbia to serve his dirty trick. But dirty knights at Liege quite upset this dirty dick. His luggage labelled England and his programme nicely set. He shouted first off Paris, but he hasn't got there yet. For Belgium put the kibosh on the Kaiser. Europe took the stick and made him sore. On his throne it hurts to sit, and when John Bull starts to hit, he will never sit upon it anymore. Belgium put the kibosh on the Kaiser. Europe took the stick and made him sore. We shall shout the victory's joy. Hold your hand up, naughty boy. You must never play at soldiers anymore. But Mr. Asquith, the Prime Minister, was disgusted with the undue optimism of the people and the press. All that has gone on so far, except at Liège, is mere affairs of outposts. And it looks today as though the Germans will be able to enter and occupy Brussels. Brussels was reached on August the 20th. Compared with that of the Germans, who had some two million men on the move, and with the French, who had one million three hundred thousand in arms, the strength of the British expeditionary force seemed puny indeed. It numbered a mere 110,000 men. But it was considered to be the best trained fighting force in the world at that time. So the BEF, confident that the job wouldn't take them long, marched to embark at New Haven, Dover, Southampton or Bristol to the loud cheers of admiring civilians, the music of military bands and to the sound of their own voices singing the popular songs of the day. Hold your hand out, naughty boy! Hold your hand out, naughty boy! At Mons, the Germans, far superior in numbers and equipment, struck at and overwhelmed the British force. In spite of the BEF's deadly rifle tactics, so rapid was their fire that the Germans thought they were up against machine guns, they were driven back towards the French border. Southwards, the roads were blocked with panic-stricken refugees pulling carts or pushing prams heavily laden with children and personal belongings. In their eagerness to flee, they blocked the roads and gummed up the works of war. Back and back went the BEF, almost to the gates of Paris. The British and French forces, exhausted by their long retreat, turned, fought the Germans to a standstill, inflicted great losses on them, and drove them back to the River Aisne. There the Germans rallied and dug themselves in. The French did the same. And the trench warfare, which was to dominate the fighting for the next four years, had begun. To defend the Channel ports, the BEF moved northwards from its positions along the Aisne to the area of the little Belgian town of Ypres, 
or as the soldiers called it, wipers. Here, thought the Kaiser, the mighty German army, flushed with its recent success at Antwerp, would easily annihilate the British. The order of the day from the German HQ declared... The German forces will march over Sir John French and his contemptible little army. The battle began on October the 27th and lasted until November the 17th. The old contemptibles held against almost impossible odds and the channel ports of Dunkirk and Calais were saved, but at a cost of more than 50,000 lives. Mons, the Marne, the Aisne and Ypres are both their monuments and their graves. We were summoned from the hillside. We were called in from the glen. And the country from the prairie. And the staring call for men. Let no tears add to their hardship. As the soul. Dunkirk on the North Sea, through part of Belgium, through eastern France, and right down to Switzerland, ran two parallel lines of trenches. In these opposing ditches, the armies of the Allies and the Central Powers squatted and waited. The war became static. It was, comparatively speaking, all quiet on the Western Front, and it remained so until the spring of 1915. Meanwhile, back home, the civilians were doing their best to carry on business as usual. People were still very optimistic. After all, the German advance had been halted and a million men had responded to Kitchener's call for volunteers. Posters were everywhere calling young and single men to come and do their bit. What did you do in the war, Daddy? Rally round the flag, every fit man wanted. Women of England, do your duty. Send your men today to join our glorious army. Some women had their own way of persuading men to join the forces. Some gave out white feathers. Others took their cue from Phyllis Dare and with the aid of a voice plus a charming personality, sang many a young man into the trenches. The army and the navy need attention. The outlook isn't healthy, you'll admit. But I've got a perfect dream of a new recruiting scheme, which I really think is absolutely it. If only other girls would do as I do, I believe that we could manage it alone. For I'll turn all students from me But the Satan and the Tommy I've an army and a navy of my own On Sunday I walk out with the soldier On Monday I'm taken by a tour On Tuesday I'm out 
with the baby Boy Scout on Wednesday. Oh, on Thursday, I gang we a Scotty. On Friday, the captain of the crew. recruits were crowded into training camps. They were fed on a monotonous diet and trained by tough, hard-mouthed sergeants in the old army tradition. To most recruits, 11 months training seemed an uncommonly long time, especially when they were so eager to get to the front and finish the war. They began to grouse, another old army tradition. They put us in the army and they handed us a pack. They took away our nice new clothes and dressed us up in cack. They marched us 20 miles or more to fit us for the war. We didn't mind the 19, but the last one made us sore. Oh, it's not the pack that you carry on your back, nor the gun upon your shoulder, nor the five-inch crust of France's dirty dust that makes you feel your limbs are growing older. It's not the load on the heart strength road that drives away your smile If the sons of sister praise a blister Blame it on the last long mile One day we had maneuvers on dear old Salisbury Plain We marched and marched and marched and marched and marched and marched again I thought the Duke of York a fool, but he wasn't in the van With us who marched and marched and marched and marched back home again Oh, it's not the pack that you carry on your back Nor the gun upon your shoulder Nor the five-inch crust of France's dirty dust That makes you feel your limbs are growing older It's not the load on the hard straight road that drives away With their training over at last, the men of the new army were shipped across the channel to join the thousands of other volunteers from all parts of the British Empire. They entered the battle area by degrees. With the guidance of the seasoned soldiers in charge of them, they gradually got used to the sound of gunfire, the sounds of the different shells, and the shape of enemy planes. Words of the French language, very much anglicised, became part of their vocabulary. Some learned to swear. It often seemed to keep their courage up during times of heavy shelling. And they also learned new songs which they sang on the march, in the dugout, or behind the line. Songs which, unlike the patriotic ditties heard at home, truly reflected the character and attitude of the frontline soldier facing the realities of war. Mademoiselle from Armentis, parlez-vous, 
Mademoiselle from Armentiers. Hallelujah. Mademoiselle from Armentiers. She hasn't been kissed for 40 years. Dinky, dinky, hallelujah. Mademoiselle from Gay Paris. Hallelujah. Mademoiselle from Gay Paris. Hallelujah. She got the palm and the croidiger for washing the soldiers' underwear. Dinky, dinky, hallelujah. Pop was true to me, Hallelujah. My girl from Pop was true to me, Hallelujah. She was true to me, she was true to you, she was true to the old damned army too. Thank you, thank you, Hallelujah. Oh my, what a rotten song! What a rotten song! What a rotten song! Oh my, what a rotten song! And what a rotten singer too! We are Fred Carmel's army, the ragtime infantry. We cannot fight, we cannot shoot, what a few use are we? And when we get to Berlin, the Kaiser, he will say, Hawk, hawk, my God, what a bloody rotten lot of the ragtime In the forward line, the men lived like moles. Each battalion usually had its own trench which varied in length from approximately a thousand yards to two miles. It was linked to others and to the reserve area in the rear by a network of communication trenches. In front of every trench were tangled, twisted hedges of barbed wire. Beyond the wire was no man's land, its soil churned up by countless shells. Where there had once been beautiful woodlands, there were now nothing but shattered stumps. The whole area was littered with rusty rifles, bayonets, old tin hats, and all the paraphernalia of bygone raids and battles. And among all that rubbish, sometimes only half covered by the soil, lay the remains of the dead. The stench of death was everywhere. Beyond no man's land were the German trenches, sometimes hundreds of yards away, sometimes only a few feet. Soldiers arriving at the front line or its vicinity usually announced the fact with a single reiterative sentence set to an old Scottish air. We're here because we're here because we're here because we're here We're here because we're here because we're here because we're here which could be the only reason for anybody arriving in such an unmitigated hell as we occupied during the three years in which I served as a soldier of the line along the Western Front. Keeping alive in the trenches was an art. If you passed a small opening where maybe a sandbag had collapsed without ducking your head low, it was on the cards you'd have it blown off. Then there were the shells. They were of all kinds. We recognized them by their whine or the kind of noise they made when they exploded. There were the Crumps, the Jack Johnsons, the Minis, the Oompas, Bolars, Pipsqueaks, and Whizbangs. We seem to be very popular with the Germans who shelled our sector. Trenches were the best protection against shell fire. A deep dugout was about the safest place you could be during a bombardment. We spent a great deal of time in them, except during battles, of course, or when on a raid or doing a turn on the fire step. I must say I felt safer in a dugout than I did back in the rest area's sleeping huts. Huts were apt to be bombed at night by enemy planes, but so were the trenches, or bombarded by gas shells, which was much worse. Bombed last night, and bombed the night before, gonna get bombed tonight if we never get bombed anymore. When we're bombed, we're scared as we can be. Oh, God, stop the bombing planes from high Germany. They're over us, they're over us. One shell hold for just the four of us. Thank your lucky stars, there are no more of us. Cause one of us could live it all alone. Gassed last night, and gassed the night before. 
gonna get gassed again if we never get gassed anymore. When we're gassed, we're sick as we can be, cause phosphine and mustard gas is much too much for me. They're warning us, they're warning us, one respirator for the four of us. Thank you, lucky stars, the three of us can run, so one of us can use it all alone. At night, there was a fair amount of activity. Groups of men crawled across the strip of no man's land, spied on or raided the enemy's trenches, and brought back a prisoner or two for questioning. Others would be detailed to mend the wire which had been broken by shell fire. The Germans were up to exactly the same tricks, of course, with roughly the same amount of success or failure. Keep your head down, Fritzy boy! Keep your head down! Fritzy boy! Last night in the pale moonlight We saw ya, we saw ya You were mending your broken wire When we opened rapid fire If you want to see your father and your fatherland Keep your head down, Fritzy boy! Every morning we were issued with a ration of rum Usually in our tea before an attack, the tea often consisted of two or three parts rum. If it didn't, every private believed his ration had been tampered with. This was pure imagination, of course. Sometimes there wasn't enough to go round, in which case there was nothing to do but grit your teeth and lump it. If the sergeant steals your rum, never mind. If the sergeant steals your rum, never mind. Though he's just a ruddy sot, you must let him have the lot. If the sergeant steals your rum, never mind. If old Jerry shells the trench, never mind. If old Jerry shells the trench, never mind. And though the sandbags fly, you have only once to die If old Jerry shells the trench Never mind oh, never mind Going over the top was described as the moment of truth During a big raid or a battle, the enemy's trenches would be pounded for hours or maybe days by high explosive shells. Then the bombardment would cease, the whistle would sound, and with bayonets fixed over the top we'd go. Machine guns spitting rapid death at us, mowing us down like a scythe through the corn. Among the lesser discomforts of living in a trench were the rats, the lice, and the rain. When it rained in Flanders, the water which in peacetime would have drained off into the dikes and canals fill the trenches instead. Men stood knee-deep in icy water so long that they completely lost all sense of feeling in their legs and feet. When the time came for them to be relieved or to return to the reserve area, they found they couldn't walk. They had developed a new disease, trench feet. Their feet swelled, turned black, and hurt something shocking. Fortunately, they soon found a cure for that. Every man was made to regularly massage his feet with oil. Trench feet finally faded out. Then trench fever came to take its place. This was caused by lice, of which every soldier carried a good supply in his clothing. Nothing we could do could stop them making a meal out of us and infecting us. No wonder we were always blooming well grousing. Grousing, grousing, grousing. The sight and smell of death all about us, the average soldier seemed to become immune to its horrors. Perhaps we laughed and joked about death in order to hide our fear of it. 
or our disgust. I knew men who actually ran sweepstakes during a shell bombardment on who would or would not be hit. In the Ypres salient, where casualties averaged 7,000 a day, death was so common that men who received wounds were considered lucky. At least they were alive, out of the fight and heading for a clean bed with dry sheets. Maybe they were even bound for Blighty. It was like receiving a ticket to paradise. The bells of hell go ting-a-ling-a-ling for you, but not for me. And the little devils, how they sing a ling a ling for you, but not for me. Oh, death, where is thy sting a ling a ling? Oh, grave thy victory. The bells of hell go ting a ling a ling for you, but not for me. I have no pain, dear mother, now, but oh, I am so dry. Come, let me to a brewery and lead me there to lie. Oh, to die. The so-called morning hate, or the indiscriminate machine gunning and shelling of the lines at dawn, accounted for many deaths. Then there were the mines. Both sides would spend weeks or even months tunnelling under each other's trenches, laying high explosives and blowing whole stretches of line and their occupants sky high. Ypres salient must have been the most unhealthy section of the whole front throughout the whole war. We hated it. Sing me to sleep the shadows fall let me forget the war and all. Damp is my dog out cold on my feet. Nothing but biscuits and bully to eat. Over the sandbags, helmets you'll find. Corpses in front and corpses behind. Damp is my dog out cold. Hold on my feet Waiting for the whiz-bangs To put me to sleep Off, off from wipers I long to be Where German snipers can get Grumbling with a British soldier is said to be a sign of high morale. In that case, we must have had the highest morale in history, for I never heard so much grumbling in all my life. But after all, what's a bit of mud? A drop of icy water, a few shells, a raid, a cloud of gas, trench feet or trench fever, so long as you have your health and strength. Up to your waist in water, up to your eyes in slush Using the kind of language that makes the sergeant blush Who wouldn't join the army, that's what we all inquire Don't we pity the poor civilian sitting beside the fire Oh, 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 it's a lovely war Who wouldn't be a soldier in? Oh, it's a shame to take the pain Oh, as soon as the valley is gone
But we never get up till the sergeant brings our breakfast up to bed. Oh, 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 it's a lovely war. What do we want with eggs and ham when we got plum and apple jam? Oh, both right turn. How should we spend the money we earn? The Great War had turned into one of attrition. The victors of a battle, in which little if any territorial gain was made, were deemed to be those with fewer casualties. Yet, discipline was maintained. Thousands of men obeying orders from immediately above or indirectly from the staff HQ in the comfortable shadows behind the lines went, uncomplaining, to certain death. In spite of mud, blood, hell and high water, they smiled and carried on. Private Perks is a funny little codger with a smile, a funny smile. Five feet none, he's an awful little dodger with a smile, a sunny smile. Flush or broke, he'll have his little joke. He can't be suppressed. All the other fellas have to grin when he gets this off his chest. Pack hey! up your troubles in your own kit bag and smile, smile, smile. While you were Lucifer to light your bag, smile, boys, that's the During the so-called quiet periods, few soldiers stayed in the firing line for more than a few weeks at a time. There were often weeks of rest to be had behind the lines and we were given the chance to get clean, change our clothes, take extra training or go on special courses. For a man just back from the line, the most sought-after luxury was a bath. We filed into the bathhouses with distinct enthusiasm, singing lustily and cheerfully of the rare antiseptic pleasure to come. Whiter than the white wash on the wall. Whiter than the white wash on the wall. Oh, wash me in the water that you wash your dirty daughter, and I shall be whiter than the white wash on the wall. On the wall. On the wall. On the wall. In his off-duty moments, in the sweet green fields of Flanders where the puppies grew, the frontline soldier could play cricket or football. At night, he could be sure of a cup of cha and a wad served by kindly old gentlemen in bleak, unostentatious uniforms at the church army or YMCA. Or he could go to the naffy and enjoy a weak but cheap glass of beer and a sing-song. Find 
to find the sergeant. We know where he is. He's lying on the canteen floor. We see him. We see him lying on the canteen floor. We see him. We see him lying on the canteen floor. If you want the old battalion, we know where they are. We know where. Then there were the concert parties. The first of these left London during Christmas week of 1914. It included such famous names as Seymour Hicks, Ellen Terrace, Gladys Cooper, and Ivy St. Helier. Of course, not all sectors were fortunate enough to enjoy such exceptional talent, but the boys welcomed any kind of entertainment and entered into the spirit of the occasion with gusto. Next to a minor blighty wound, the most coveted piece of luck was blighty leave. London was only seven and a half hours or so from the fighting line, but it seemed as remote from the war as heaven is from hell. To some men, after one, two, or even three years in the trenches, the feeling at home about the war was very changed. There was a distinctly more sober attitude to it than there had been at the outbreak. In fact, almost the only place where a thoroughly optimistic atmosphere could be found was the music hall. There's a dear old lady, Mother Britain is her name, and she's all the world to me. She's a dear old soul, always the same, with a heart as big as three. And when troubles and trials are knocking at her door, and the day seems dark and long, her son's on the land, her son's on the sea. 
they all march to the song. When the fighting is over and the war is won, and the flags are waving free, when the bells are ringing and the boys are singing songs in every key, when we all gather round the old fireside and the old mother kisses her son. The greatest innovation a soldier returning to Blighty would notice was the change in attitude to the status of women. Everywhere they were either doing men's work or wearing the uniform of one of the women's services. Then there was the new prosperity, particularly of the working classes, whose high wages enabled them to buy luxury goods they'd never possessed before, pianos, for instance, or fur coats. Strikes for higher pay among munition workers and allied trades irked the private soldier who had to face daily death for less than two shillings a day. And the sight of those people to whom the war meant larger profits, enjoying themselves at restaurants and bars, irked him even more. Some soldiers openly declared that they were almost glad when their leave was over and the time came for them to return. Perhaps they felt restless at the thought of what their comrades were going through without them to share it, or to help grumble and grouse about it. Brother Bert, he went away to do his bit the other day. With a smile on his lips and his lieutenant pips upon his shoulder, bright and gay. As the train moved out, he said, remember me to all the birds. Then he wagged his paw and went away to war, shouting out these pathetic words. During 1915, both sides made repeated bloody attempts to break through each other's lines at Neuve-Chapelle, at Ypres, and at Champagne. But at the end of a year's fighting, the two lines of trenches remained in much the same position as at the beginning, except that the flesh and blood of thousands more men, the flower, it is said, of Britain's youth, had now become part of the muddy soil. I wore a tunic, a dirty khaki tunic, and you wore your silly clothes. We fought and bled at loose while you were on the booze, the booze that no one here knows. Oh, you were with the wenches while we were in the trenches facing an angry foe. Oh, you were 
the introduction of conscription in 1916 brought the total strength of the British Army to five million men. Nearly every fit man in the country was called up and trained for military service. In February 1916, the Germans launched a fierce and desperate attack against the French at Verdun. The battle lasted for five months, but the French line didn't break. The total losses of both sides in dead and wounded were in the region of 1,100,000. In July, the French and British launched a combined attack against the German lines at the Battle of the Somme. The fighting went on until November. The gains were slight, the losses extremely heavy. 1917 arrived without celebration, either in the trenches or on the home front. At dawn on the first day of the new year, the Germans exercised their morning hate and, as usual, swept no man's land with machine gun fire. Death lurked in every shell whine, every crack of a sniper's rifle, and the evil chatter of a hidden machine gun. It was a hell of a war, and looked as though it would never end. I want to go home. I want to go home. I don't want to go to the trenches no more Where whiz-bangs and shrapnel, they whistle and roar Take me over the sea Where the alley man can't get at me Oh my, I don't want to die I want to go enthusiastic about the fight, merely resigned to it. But they fought like demons and with tremendous courage, as did the enemy. Hardly a man of the original old contemptibles was left. Between July and November, the British launched another all-out attack near Ypres. It has been described as the greatest and most futile slaughter in modern times. It rained incessantly and the battle was fought in mud, a slough of despond. In spite of tremendous courage and tenacity on the part of the fighting men, only a slight gain was made over the Germans. When this cruel war is over, no more soldiering for me. When I get my civic clothes on, oh, how happy I shall be. Church parades on Sundays No more putting in for leave I shall kiss the sergeant major How I'll miss him, how he'll grieve No more standing to Trenchers Only one more church parade No more shivering on the fire step No more ticklers
The most important event of a war at this time was the entry of the United States. But though friendly disposed towards the Allies, the USA had up to now remained neutral. Many of her people's sympathies were indeed with the Central Powers. The mother tongue of some 18 millions of her subjects was German. But German arrogance and the deliberate sinking of American ships during the blockade of Great Britain forced the United States to come in. Once the USA was in, Germany made a desperate effort to finish the war before the American troops could be shipped to France. Submarine warfare against Britain was stepped up and thousands of tons of shipping sunk. At one period, food stocks in England were down to less than three weeks' supply. Rationing had to be introduced, both to stop profiteering and to allow fair shares for everybody. But in spite of the German Atlantic submarine fleet, Americans were soon pouring into France. By 1918, although no one would have believed it had you told them, the end was in sight. In March, the Germans launched their last desperate offensive against the Allied lines and broke through. In May, the Germans attacked the French on the Aisne and forced them back to the Marne. Once more, Paris was threatened. On July the 18th, 1918, French and American forces launched their now historic counterattack and chased the Germans back across the river. On August the 8th, the British launched their great offensive in the Somme area. In a little over a month, a hundred thousand German prisoners were taken and the enemy was in full retreat on a front of more than 140 miles. But before the Germans could be completely driven out of France, they collapsed entirely and asked for an armistice. It was signed on November the 11th. So we came to the end of the long, long trail and out into a new, but some would say not necessarily a better world. Strewn along that trail of war were upwards of 10 million men who had on all European fronts been killed in the fighting and another 20 million or so who had died through the hardships of the war. As a living reminder of man's cruelty to man, there were also the wounded, the limbless, the burned, the gassed and the blind. This, said the men who were left, must never happen again. In the long, long trail, soldiers' songs of the First World War, the singers were Benny Lee, Rita Williams, John Gower, Andy Cole, Barbara Lee, John Bolter, and the George Mitchell Choir. The BBC Review Orchestra, leader Julian Gaillard, was conducted by Malcolm Lockyer. The mouth organist was Alfie Kahn, and the musical arrangements were by George Mitchell and Alfred Ralston. Narrators were Andrew Foles, Alan Keith and John Ruddock. The Long Long Trail was written and produced by Charles Chilton. And in this weekend's Archive on Four, you can hear more about the story behind Charles Chilton's forgotten masterpiece, as told by Roy Hudd, a close friend and collaborator of Charlie, as he called him. If you missed it, you'll find it on the Radio 4 iPlayer.